Now this morning, as we turn to the book of Acts, to the chapter 2, we want to give our consideration to the verses 14 through to 41, and to look at what we have called the first Christian sermon. The first Christian sermon. Now, you're all probably aware that one of the number one fears that most people have is that of speaking in public. It even ranks higher than the fear of death on some lists. And the fear of speaking in public would increase if you realized that you would be speaking to a hostile audience, people that really didn't want to hear what you had to say. Imagine how worse it would be if that hostile audience wasn't just a small group, but actually numbered in the thousands. And you have to stand and address them without a microphone or a PA system to amplify your voice. And to make matters worse, it could be worse, you have just made a fool of yourself before these people just a few weeks previous. And you can be sure that everyone in your audience knows all about your catastrophic failures. Plus you've had no time to prepare a message. But your time has come. The opportunity presents itself. And you're on without any notes. That's the situation Peter was facing here on the day of Pentecost. Some have been asking the question, genuinely curious there in verse 12, what meaneth this? What's all this is happening? What's it all about? Others in the crowd are mocking and filled with unbelief and accusing the apostles of being drunk. And it's to this crowd in the city of Jerusalem that Peter must address the message of salvation. Telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ who had been crucified in the city just some seven weeks previous. Now as far as results are concerned, this is one of the most miraculous and greatest sermons ever preached. 3,000 souls are converted at the end of Peter's sermon. Now Luke gives us really only the essence of of what Peter preached about. I don't believe we have his entire message here. But even though he has given us just an idea of what Peter preached about. There's far too much for us to go into any real kind of detail in our allotted time this morning. So what I propose that we do today is give you an overview of Peter's message. And then come back and look at some parts of it in more depth a little bit later. What I would want us to grasp this morning is really Peter's main theme and his method and his argument. And even though you may not be called upon to preach as Peter was in front of a hostile crowd, studying his message and the way that he approached it will certainly be beneficial to you when it comes to sharing God's word. So let's look at this first Christian sermon. And I point you out, first of all, his introduction. The introduction to Peter's sermon. Like any good preacher or public speaker, Peter has an introduction. And one of the key features of an introduction is to grab people's attention, to captivate them with the theme of what you're about to speak upon. And that's what Peter does. You notice in verse 14 that Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. He's grasping their attention. Men of Jerusalem and Judea listen to me. I've got a message for you. You notice that he lifted up his voice. He intends to be heard. And he begins by addressing the questions that have been raised 
by the great crowd before. They've witnessed this phenomena of the Holy Ghost being poured out upon the apostles. They've heard them speaking in unlearned languages, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those that have come to the city of Jerusalem. And he reminds them and tells them that what they're witnessing that day was a fulfillment of the prophecy that's found in the book of Joel in the chapter 2. And you'll notice that twice Peter appeals to his audience to listen carefully to what he has to say. At the end of verse 14 he says, Hearken to my words, give attention to what I'm saying. The same thing in verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. You see, it doesn't really matter how dynamic or even how dull a preacher might be. There's still a responsibility upon those who come to listen carefully. Whether the preacher is exciting or whether he is not. It's the message that's important. And Peter says, listen to what I have to say. Now, you'll remember that the Lord Jesus was perhaps the most gifted speaker in all of history. No one spoke like he did. And yet even he exhorted his audience in Luke chapter 8 and verse 18. He says, take heed therefore how ye hear. Make sure you're paying attention, he said. So while there's a great deal of responsibility upon the preacher to make his sermon at least easy to listen to and to understand, there's also a responsibility upon those that hear it to pay attention and to to seek to learn and to understand what's been said. So Peter begins by getting their attention. Listen to me, I have a message that you need to hear. And then he addresses their question. Some, in verse 13, mockingly said, these men are full of new wine. They're accused of being drunk. Now that charge doesn't surprise us. It still happens today to some extent. Those that are determined to resist the work of God will make up all kinds of accusations and charges against it. You've probably heard some say that, well, faith or religion, that's for the the emotionally crippled. That's for those who need a crutch to get through life. That's for those that are intellectually limited. Been well said and well repeated that faith is the opiate for the masses. Peter addresses the charge head on as we should also he points out to them it's only nine o'clock in the morning. And no self-respecting Jew would be drunk at nine in the morning, especially on a holy feast day. We're not drunk, he says. He says this rather is the fulfillment of that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. And he goes on then and to, to quote what Joel has said there in verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And he tells them, this is what you're seeing. This is what's happening. Now he'll go on a little bit later to quote from Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. Now the thing is Peter didn't have a Bible in front of him the same way that we would. The Bible wasn't yet available in a book format such as we enjoy. Books weren't yet invented. Nor did he roll out several scrolls so that he might turn to the right text and read those verses. So how then could he quote from the book of Joel. And from the book of Psalms. Because he's memorized. He's learned these verses. 
And if you want to be an effective witness for the Savior, then there are certain key scripture verses that are good to memorize. You'll remember over the last number of weeks and months, we've been putting some in the order of service. Verses to memorize. Verses that we think might be helpful when it comes to witnessing to God's truth and sharing the gospel with others. You'll not always have a Bible at hand. But it's good to have God's word in your heart so that you can share it with others. No, we're not drunk, he says. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken of by the prophet Joel. We're not filled with wine. We're filled with something far greater. We've been filled with God's Holy Spirit. Just as the scriptures have prophesied. And so like a good preacher does. He begins with his text there in the book of Joel. And he explains what it means. And tells them this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now Joel prophesied three things in particular. In that passage that Peter quoted. In verse 17 and 18, there's the prophecy that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. It shall come to pass in those last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now the term there, the last days, speaks of a time from our Savior's first coming until his second coming. We are in the last days. Days. Now the apostles didn't realize that the last days would stretch 2,000 years and more. But these are the last days that are spoken of in the scriptures. Or as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. That we are the ones upon whom the ends of the world have come. Peter's quotation from Joel is simply making the point that we are now living in the fulfillment of. Of God's prophecies. And Peter's main point is not so much upon the outpouring of God's spirit. But rather who it will be poured out upon. It will be poured out upon all flesh. Now pr- prior to this God's Holy Spirit had been given. To certain individuals in the Old Testament times. Especially upon God's prophets. Sometimes upon The kings and also upon the priests. But what Peter is making clear. Is that the prophecy in Joel. Tells us that God's spirit would be poured out upon all. Regardless of their age. Their sex. Their economic status. There's a promise of the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit. You're a witness to that he said. God's spirit has now filled the 120 that We're met in the upper room waiting for the promise of God. It's not just limited to the twelve men and women, young and old. We're being filled with God's Spirit. And moving on from that day, all true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will be indwelled by God's Spirit upon their conversion. There'll be a pouring out of God's Spirit upon all flesh. Now what else did Joel speak about? He spoke about judgment. The outpouring of God's spirit will be followed by a time of terrible judgment. I will show wonders in heaven above. Signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness. The moon into blood. Before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Peter doesn't know just how soon these judgments will take place. But he says they will come after the outpouring of God's Spirit. The great and notable day of the Lord is coming and there's judgments that will surround it. And since the prophecy concerning the outpouring of God's Spirit has now been fulfilled, it's reasonable then to assume that the rest of the prophecy will be fulfilled In due course. Now some look at these prophecies. Of the sun and the moon and the blood and the fire and the vapor of smoke. As pointing to the darkness that prevailed over the earth. At the time of Christ's crucifixion. I certainly don't have a problem with that. 
But I also read in Revelation chapter 6 that these same signs occur when the Lamb breaks the sixth seal. So while these signs may have been fulfilled in part at Calvary, I believe their literal fulfillment still awaits that time prior to the Lord's return when he will come back to judge the nations of this world. The point is, Peter's saying that the outpouring of God's Spirit by prophesied by Joel has happened. The messianic age has begun. And the prophecies that follow it concerning judgment to follow can't be far away. And with that he offers the third part of Joel's prophecy. The good news of salvation will be offered to all there. Verse 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's the great mercy of God. That those who rightly deserve his judgment will be offered a means of escape. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The salvation available from the hand of God. And it's offered to us simply for the asking. As Paul reminds us, it is the gift of God and not of works lest any man should boast. And the wonderful thing about the salvation of God is that it's offered to the whosoever. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't matter who you are or what you have done or how far you have fallen or how deep the pit of sin you have fallen into. That whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful promise. And Peter has introduced his message. This is what I'm going to speak about. He said. This is the great theme that we have to lay before you. So having given his introduction, Peter then gives the focus of his sermon. Now you might think in light of what he's just said about the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and the outpouring of God's Spirit, that he'll preach a sermon on the Holy Spirit. But that's not what he preaches about. He preaches about the Savior. Look at verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. That's who he wants to preach about. He wants to preach about Jesus. And as marvelous and as wonderful as the coming of the Holy Spirit was, that's not where Peter's attention is focused. He wants to tell them something about the Savior. The Lord Jesus should be the primary focus of our preaching and our teaching and our witnessing. And Peter sets out to show that Jesus of Nazareth, who he really is, and he presents certain truths about him that they need to know. That God has authenticated Jesus of Nazareth as Lord and Christ. He has proven him to be the authentic Messiah. And how did he do that? Well, first of all, through his miracles. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and signs and wonders which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know even our saviour's enemies had to admit the fact that he did some miraculous things even though they attributed his power to belonging to Satan they still recognized there was something miraculous taking place many like Nicodemus who came to the Lord Jesus by night, could testify that no one can do these signs that you do except God is with him. The miracles attested to the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. And Peter reminds them that the Lord Jesus had done many such miracles and you know all about them. You've heard about them. There's no one else who can raise the dead like the Lord Jesus did. No one else has power over nature like he does. No one else can heal the sick, the blind, the lame, the deaf, the dumb, the way that he has done. 
You can't explain his miracles except by testifying God has empowered him. There's no denying of his miracles. You're eyewitnesses to these wonderful events. That's why he says at the end of verse 22, as ye yourselves also know, these things weren't done in a corner. You know all about them. Many of you have been eyewitnesses to these very events of what we're talking about. And through these miraculous powers that Christ has manifest, God has authenticated him as Lord and Christ. Not just through his miracles, but also through his death. Peter's about, about to stand upon some toes here. He says in verse 23 concerning Christ, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You know, for many, the death of the Lord Jesus seemed to invalidate his claim to be the Messiah. For many there in Jerusalem, this crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ was actually a major barrier to them believing upon him as the Messiah. That's because back in the book of Deuteronomy, we read there that it was a, a cursed thing to hang upon a tree. That the Lord Jesus was cursed through the death that he had suffered. How could one so cursed be the Messiah who was promised is there? Peter says that that wasn't a failure on God's part. It wasn't that God's plan has somehow gone astray. The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ was actually an essential part of God's eternal plan to bring redemption to mankind. He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He didn't die because the Father has rejected him the way that his enemies have said. He was not delivered because of some personal weakness in himself. He could have called 12 legions of angels to come and fight in his behalf if he had wanted. No, the reason that he died upon the cross is because it was part of God's plan for our salvation. He had to be accursed in order that the curse might be taken from us. That's why the Bible describes our Savior as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is part of God's eternal plan to save us. He's described as a Lamb because that speaks of the sacrificial nature of his death. That's prophesied all through the Old Testament. In particular in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. The sacrificial nature of his death points to the salvation that God will provide. Ah, but Peter says, not only was he put to death because of the plan of God, but he was predetermined to die as our sin. So rather than his death invalidating him, his death actually authenticates him. It authenticates the fulfillment of God's wonderful plan. Now does that mean that because God determined it that men were not responsible for it? Not at all. Peter says you nailed him to the cross. The hands of wicked men took him and put him to death. And they did so without their will being violated at all. God simply used those evil men to accomplish his eternal purposes. But those men were responsible for their crimes. No one can say God made me do it. They did it themselves. Ye have taken. With cruel and wicked hands crucified the sea. So our, the Lord Jesus is authenticated as the Messiah by the miracles that he performed. Through the death that he died. And then. Peter says he's authenticated by the fact that he rose from the dead. Quite interesting. Peter 
speaks of the death of Christ in one verse and then takes nine verses to speak about the resurrection of the Savior. You put him to death, he said. But he also says, verse 24, that God raised him up. God raised him up. You were guilty of opposing God, but God will overrule. And then he quotes from Psalm 16 to prove again the, the authenticity of the resurrection. He speaks of David. How David declared that God has said that he will not leave his soul in hell or Hades, the place of, the, of, of death. That he will not allow his Holy One to see corruption or to undergo decay. And Peter says, well, David has both died and is buried and his tomb is right here in Jerusalem. His body has underwent decay. It's obvious David's not speaking about himself. He's speaking about one of his descendants, the Messiah whom God will raise up. He was looking ahead prophetically, not only to the death of the sacrificial lamb, but to his resurrection from the dead. And so Peter is able to very confidently declare in verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Proving again that he was who he said he was. And then there's one last authentication. Beginning in verse 33. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he says, is proof. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. The Saviour promised before he died that he would ascend to heaven and he would send the Holy Spirit to be upon his followers. And this is evidence that the promise of Christ is true. He is who he said he is. The theme of Peter's message is the Lord Jesus Christ proving him to be the Saviour of men. Through his miracles, through his death, through his resurrection, through the outpouring of God's Spirit that you're now a witness of. That was the focus of Peter's message. And what was the response to it? What was the response? Well, you notice there in verse 36, Peter gives his conclusion. Therefore, in light of all of these things that we've been talking about, the things that we have sought to prove to you, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Back in verse 22, Peter begins by referring to Jesus of Nazareth as a man approved of God. Because that's where his audience were in their think. He's just a man. But by the time he gets to verse 36. Peter says that man Jesus of Nazareth. God has approved. As Lord and Christ. Lord and Christ. The crowd responds with conviction. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Pricked in their heart. There's feelings of deep anguish as they realize that they've been guilty of murdering their own Messiah. They're greatly convicted. They've been smitten of God in their conscience and they're trembling at the thought that we have killed the very one that we said we were looking for to deliver us. The Holy Spirit has stabbed them with conviction of the terrible sins that they've been guilty of committing. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this text. He says, it is foolish to attempt to heal those who are not wounded. Wounded. 
It's foolish to attempt to clothe those who have never been stripped. And it's foolish to make those rich who have never realized their poverty. He says the conviction of sin is often the missing note in our evangelistic efforts. In other words, we're too quick in trying to heal people who don't even realize that they're mortally ill. We need God to show them their desperate condition. That they're lost and undone before God. That they're without hope if they do not have the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's then that we show them the wondrous grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. So being convicted in their hearts, Peter then applies his message. Here's what he says. Men and brethren, repent. Repent. That's the first thing he says. There must be a change of direction to your life. It's more than just a, a, mental, a, a mental change or a mental attitude. It's more than just a feeling of remorse for the terrible things that you've done. It signifies a turning away from those things, turning away from the sinful, and a turning to God in repentance. Repent, he said. Then he says something next. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Before I speak in baptism, let me just say that he says every one of you. He's calling them to an individual response. Salvation is a personal thing between you and the Lord. It's not something that we, that we get as a group plan for us all. Every one of you individually needs to repent and call upon the Lord. And then he speaks about baptism. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the remission of sins. Baptism, of course, is that outward mark of identification with Christ and with his church. And when Peter calls upon these people to be baptized, he's calling upon them to make a radical break with their culture and their religion in which they'd crucified the Messiah. And he says, I want you rather to be publicly identified with Jesus Christ. Now, we need to understand that when he calls them to be baptized, he's asking them to make a public decision that will very likely see them ostracized by their family and perhaps even killed for the choice that they're about to make. When you're being baptized in Peter's day, you're making a very bold declaration about your faith in Jesus Christ. Peter says we need to repent of our sins and come to God and ask for forgiveness. And then we need to take our stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. We put our hope in him and him alone. And we must be willing to be hated by the rest of the world if that's what it takes to be identified with Christ. This outward symbol would give some kind of proof. To the reality of the inward repentance and faith. That God has forgiven their sins. And then he makes a wonderful promise to them there in verse 37. and verse 38. He says that they will receive then the gift of the Holy Ghost. There at the end of verse 38. When you repent. Come in faith to Jesus Christ. God's Holy Spirit is part of his gift towards you. And Peter extends that promise, not just to those that heard him in that day, but he says to your children also. And beyond them, even to as many as the Lord our God shall call. I find it quite wonderful that while salvation requires upon a person to call upon the name of the Lord, there in verse 21, Verse 39 reminds us that the calling actually begins with God. As many as the Lord our God shall call. Then response 
Peter's demand that they repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, 3,000 souls call upon the Lord that day. Then they were gladly, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What a wonderful message, Peter. We can take lessons from. I fear that so much that's done in the name of evangelism today tries to make becoming a Christian as easy as possible. And so we dodge the issue of sin and guilt, but Peter didn't. He confronted them with their sin. We disguise the cost of true discipleship, but Peter didn't do that. He said, I want you to be baptized and make a public stand for Christ. I want you to make a radical break from your old life and be identified with the new. And he calls them to repentance and baptism. This was a traumatic thing for the Jews of Peter's day. Baptism, that's reserved for Gentile converts who want to become like us. Peter preached boldly. And God worked inwardly. 3,000 souls were saved and the church was launched. And Peter's message in a nutshell was this, that since God has made Jesus of Nazareth a man approved among you by miracles and through his death and resurrection, God has made him both Lord and Christ and judge of the world. Repent of your sins and call upon him. Charles Simeon, preacher back in the 19th century, said that he had three very simple aims when he preached. He says, firstly, to exalt the Savior. Secondly, to humble the sinner. And thirdly, to promote holiness. You see, the point of biblical preaching is not to make people feel good about themselves. Or to make them feel that God loves them just the way that they are. The real purpose of biblical preaching is to show who Jesus Christ truly is. He's the Lord of the universe. He's the Christ of God who offered himself for our sins. He was crucified for our iniquities. He was put to death yet raised from the dead and has ascended to, on high to be with the Father. We need to show who we are in the sight of God, lost, undone, guilty, and hell deserving. And then to point to the great mercy of God that if you in repentance and faith will come to Jesus Christ, that God will save you. He'll put his spirit within you. And then we seek to live in obedience to him no matter the cost. That was the first Christian sermon preached at Pentecost. It's still the same message that we need to preach today. There is but one Savior of men, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we being guilty and hell deserving in God's sight must call upon him for salvation. And the wonderful promise is that when we do that, that the Lord will save those that call upon his name. Having done that, may we seek to be publicly identified with Christ and live a life of obedience and holiness that is well-pleasing in the sight of God, our Father. The first Christian sermon. And I trust that it will be an ongoing sermon that we will hear from this pulpit and many others, all for the glory of our Savior. Amen.